Hey there guys, alright, today we are back with some more extra history, finishing up their series on the Empire of Mali here with episode 5, The Final Bloody Act, which is probably going, no, it's probably gonna, will they talk about colonialism? I'm gonna assume, yeah, they're gonna talk about colonialism because the Portuguese were arriving right at the end, although it would be a few centuries until they move into the interior the 1800s was when people started, when the Europeans started taking over all of Africa outside of the coast, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, before we dive in, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. I would love it if you joined the Discord and followed me over at Twitch. Okay, that said, let's dive in. 1465. That's a year. The Mali Empire is overextended, barely able to garrison its territory, and riven by internal power struggles. Sensing weakness, a new player emerges, the Sorcerer King Sunni Ali, a charismatic leader and a military genius. What makes him a Sorcerer King? He is set on bringing the Can he teach me magic? I really want to learn how to do magic, man. Be cool. Disorganized northern- I totally would use it for good. I promise. Fringe of the Mali Empire, its profitable trans-Saharan trading centers, under the banner of his own empire, the Songhai. Outmatched on the battlefield and severed from their trade routes, the Mansas must learn to adapt or die. Dun dun dun! Bum, 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 bum. Generations of succession crises and revolts were taking their toll on Mali. The military was stretched thin, with cities on its northern fringe rebelling. Tarig Berbers swept in from the Sahara, capturing Timbuktu and Walata, destabilizing the economic arteries that kept the empire afloat. Raiders from neighboring states pillaged trade routes that had remained safe for nearly a century. But this was all just prelude to the rise of Sunni Ali Burr. The prince that would be king was from the old city-state of Gao, his family hailing from a region that still worshipped the spirits. His support came from the rural areas that still practiced ancestral religion, and when he took the throne of Gao in 1464, it marked a sea change in West African politics. Sunni Ali claimed to be Muslim, but that was likely political. Everybody knew that he cast shells for divination and practiced traditional magic, but like many emperors before him, he had to balance the urban Muslim interests against those of the larger, rural, non-Muslim population. Relations between the two religions were becoming strained after centuries of coexistence. This is one thing uh, that kind of also gets overlooked in uh, African history a lot, um, is this Muslim and the traditional animist stuff. I've never heard, like, even when I took a, um, a, pre a pre-colonial African history class and a early Islamic history course, um, did not learn this now maybe it was talked about briefly and i'm just forgetting but it wasn't discussed in enough detail for it to stick in my head so at the very least so yeah it's something that gets overlooked i like that they're mentioning it though the cracks had always been there urban muslims had much more power than the rural animists not just because they controlled court and the trade routes but because islamic law prevented muslims from being enslaved and soon, those tensions became explicitly political. After a few years of punishing territory violators, Ali claimed rule over the neighboring city of Timbuktu, even receiving an invitation from the governor to eject the Tarig occupiers. But the scholars of Timbuktu believed their city unique in the world, ruled not by kings, but by God. When the governor died, they rescinded the offer. But oh. it was too late. Sunni Ali was already on his way. He sacked the city for its faithlessness, forcing its leading men into exile. Wait. Faithlessness? But they said it was because they were ruled by God. It was the first of many persecutions targeting Muslim cities, whom Ali saw as supporters of his rival, Mali. But Sunni Ali was not content with a two-city state. His new empire, the Songhai, would expand along the Niger River and up to the Trans-Saharan trading towns, taking full advantage of the crumbling Mali Empire. To prosecute the war, he transformed the tribes of boatmen along the Niger into a crack riverine navy, and used this new force to secure the river's fertile delta region. 
Suni Ali was not one to trifle with. He won every battle he fought, and often with extreme brutality. Oh. But when he drowned in a boating accident, huh? His successor, Askia Muhammad, proved more traditionally Muslim, continuing Ali's conquest but also patronizing learning and science in Timbuktu. He reorganized the Songhai government as a meritocracy, where talented men could rise in state service regardless of their clan affiliation. And to show the Songhai's new status as the rulers of West Africa, he made the Hajj. By 1500, the Songhai ruled more territory than Mali ever had, and in 1545, the Songhai delivered Mali's greatest indignity. They invaded, occupying Niani and forcing the Mansa to flee. The harried Mansa regrouped in the mountains and drove the invaders out, but the message was clear. Mali might still have a continuous monarchy and rule large amounts of territory, it might hold gold mines and a piece of the Trans-Saharan trade, but it was no longer a great power. Songhai middlemen stood between their gold and the markets of North Africa. So, battered and bruised, Mali responded to Songhai's rise by adapting, increasingly setting its sights toward the Atlantic coast, which offered a unique opportunity. Because Portuguese ships had begun to arrive on Mali's shores, offering textiles, rum, and manufactured goods for gold. In the early 1400s, Portugal had entered a period of exploration and trading voyages patronized by Prince Henry the Navigator, and the tales of Mali's wealth drew them to this unseen kingdom that they called the Gold Coast. But Portugal had another objective. When reconquering the Iberian Peninsula from its North African rulers, the Spanish and Portuguese had come into contact with enslaved Africans who had been transported via the Trans-Saharan trade, and they embraced this concept. On early Atlantic voyages, they seized the Canary Islands in order to use them as a base for slave raids on the coast of Africa. Mm. The first Portuguese expeditions to Mali got massacred by locals who were far better equipped to fight in the coastal waterways. But in 1456, a Portuguese explorer made it up the Gambia River and opened the first trade negotiations with a Mali governor. It was a meeting that would change history. Because despite their rocky start, it became clear that Mali and the Portuguese had the same problem. Songhai had monopolized the Trans-Saharan trade routes, taking a bite out of every transaction in the gold and salt trades. But opening direct trade between Mali and Europe via the Atlantic coast meant that both sides would profit. And they did. The coastal region boomed, and Songhai, ironically, found traffic along their new Trans-Saharan routes beginning to slow. But the Gold Coast trade wouldn't last, oh. because the same boom in European exploration that had opened up African ports also flooded Europe with the looted gold of Central and South American empires, driving Mali's purchasing power down. The wow, how, <laughs> how the turns have tabled. Portuguese, Spanish, French, Dutch, British, Danish, and Swedish traders that were showing up on the coast now came less for gold and more for slaves. European slave markets were booming. By the close of the 15th century, 10% of Lisbon's population was of African origin. Huh? And early colonists found that parts of the New World, such as Brazil and Jamaica, were ideal for sugar cultivation, and those deadly plantations had an unending appetite for the blood and labor of enslaved people. Because producing sugar, sugarcane is a very uh, dangerous thing. Uh, when turning into sugar, I think, right? Because like it gets super fucking hot. Like there was a way they handled it back then. Ugh. It was the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade, one of the greatest tragedies and involuntary migrations in human history. Over the course, I feel like it has to be the single largest involuntary migration, right? Just because of how long it lasted. Of the next three and a half centuries, European slavers forcibly transported at least 12 million people to Europe and America. Damn, only 12 million over three and a half centuries? Actually seems a little low, if you ask me. And we are still sorting through the consequences of that trade today. <laughs> We're going to be sorting through it probably for the end of time, man. So, let's just pause for a moment here. The transatlantic slave trade was a corrosive system that left legacies of violence and inequality wherever it touched, including West Africa. 
To tell you the truth, there is so much involved with the transatlantic slave trade that after many rewrites, we ultimately decided that we would need to create a whole series and consult with experts to do this subject justice. Because only discussing the impact on Mali risks glossing over the fact that European chattel slavery was a uniquely cruel institution in world history. Also, we worried that dealing with this as a side issue would leave out a lot of the nuance in how these systems of slavery intersected. Because while it is true that West Africa had traded enslaved people for centuries, we don't want to suggest any equivalence in these two systems. So, for the sake of un Exactly, that's one of the things that I think, uh... It, it, it is a hard... because... and it became so... What... what... We're going to do a, uh, a writing example a little bit here. Uh, we're going to look to A Song of Ice and Fire for it. Um, now, Cho is partially to blame, but even in the books, even though George, uh, George R. R. Martin does explicitly slay in Slaver's Bay, that slaves are um, from like all parts. Still, even in my mind, as someone that grew up in the United States, even if that slaver's bay sl slavery is uh non-discriminatory based on uh skin color because of the part of the world i grew up in uh which has a certain history with slavery i still unless the book explicitly states a character is a different skin color i still picture them as pretty much not white <laughs> in the book even reading even after reading the book and of course i know in the show because they were filming in morocco they couldn't like just fly over like they couldn't get really white extras to be the slaves that daenerys frees which doesn't help the situation um but yeah it's it's one of the things that makes it like, even though the intention is, uh, this is very much a tangent, um, but I think it, it it's still useful in understanding just like um, people, <laughs> like our, even though for the vast majority of human history, and even today there is still slavery of people not based upon you know your skin color. Even though the vast majority of slavery uh, throughout human history, the vast amount of slaves were not chosen or not made slaves because of their skin color, because of how exceptionally brutal and really um, how this particular slavery affected culture and society uh, for the nation that would end up becoming the most powerful nation post World War II, and still at the time of recording, the most powerful nation in the world, uh, has had a hegemony since the fall of the Soviet Union until the last couple of years, where you could say China has risen up to kind of be a challenging superpower. Um, because of that, because of the U.S.'s history, like you can't, it it's a Slavery is a hard thing to talk about because of just how unique a uh, transatlantic slave trade was and the slavery of the Americas. It's just, ah, be like, I, I probably just did it super poorly there too. <laughs> Understanding what happens next, let's leave it at this. The transatlantic slave trade increasingly drained manpower from the West African kingdoms, making states like the diminished Mali less able to stand up against outside aggressors, including colonialist interventions. In 1591, Morocco moved in from the north, hoping to seize the gold routes in order to pay for war debt. They raised the salt towns in the Sahara and brought a new terror to West Africa, the Arquebus. Songhai crumbled pew, pew. before the cough of gunpowder. Moroccan armies sacked Timbuktu. The Songhai capital of Gao fell, ending 900 years of continuous rule as a city-state. The Moroccans marched on Mali, but Mansa Mahmoud Keita IV met them. In a last, proud display of imperial valor, his army engaged the invaders. 
Gunpowder jetted, cutting down the Mansa's infantry, harrowing the fine cavalry that was Shinjata's legacy. The warriors of Mali stood firm against the gunfire, shielding their homeland with their bodies, reforming every time their units were cut to ribbons. The bloodshed was atrocious, but they forced a draw. The Moroccans, stunned by this suicidal bravery, turned back. Hmm. But despite that brave nope. defense, Open Mali out. would suffer the fate of all empires. In 1610, when Mansa Mahmud Keita IV died, his three sons fought over what remained. Regional wars would become the norm until a neighboring power sacked and burned Niani in 1670. After four centuries, the Mali Empire was gone. In that time, it had knit together the pieces of shattered Ghana, become an economic powerhouse, dazzled the world with its wealth, and even outlived its rival, Songhai. Hmm. Today, the Empire of Mali is often remembered for Mansa Musa's wealth, but that's kind of unfair. It is true that the rulers of West Africa were rich, but Ghana, Songhai, and Mali were so much more than just that. They were patrons of religion and military innovators, builders who erected houses of worship and but extra history, you kind of did spend the majority of this this series just talking about their gold and not really their technology or their military innovation. And learning. Songhai craftsmen <laughs> created masks and statuary that Picasso cited as an artistic influence. But perhaps Mali's most incredible feat was to foster a multicultural population rich in diverse languages, cultures, and religious beliefs at a time when much of the world was still riven by religious conflict. Indeed, it is no accident that in 1959, when the region threw off the yoke of colonialism and needed a name for itself, one of those newly born nations looked back into its history and decided to name itself Mali. And that was the Empire of Mali, the final bloody act. Extra history number five. This was a decent episode. Um, I do think the first like couple episodes were really good, and then it kind of fell off for me. Um, but I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.